Welcome to the fourth annual Guild of Music Supervisors Conference. So they are deal makers, risk takers, art makers, and rule breakers. Each one up here is a maverick in her own right, and today we're gonna to look at composing, songwriting, and producing. But what brought me here was, um, there was an article in Billboard in January that said, where are all the female music producers? Why, are, why has no woman ever been awarded the Grammy for Producer of the Year non-classical, and what female producers face behind the boards? And that's when I learned a little bit more about Alex Hope, who we have the pleasure of having here today. And Alex, when she was 16, said she was first interested in music production and she Googled some female producers and she only came across the name of Linda Perry. And what does that mean when there's no information and no role models and people to look up to? Um, so somewhere in that notion has been reinforced that the Grammy category for producer of the year are non-classical. But since the trophy's been given out in 1975, no woman has taken home the golden gramophone. So just a handful of women, Janet Jackson, Paula Cole, Cheryl Crow, Lauren Hill, Mariah Carey, Wendy and Lisa, have been nominated, but also as artists in their own right. And there's only been one female producer who was nominated who was not the artist, and that is The Matrix, Lauren Christie, in 2004. It's pretty unbelievable, isn't it? So while being at Women in Film, I am associated with the Annenberg Research and Sundance Institute, and Loretta and I both um, work with Sundance. And so here's some brief statistics before we jump in. But only 22% of all performers across 600 of the most popular songs from 2012 and 2017 were female. Moreover, 2017 was a six-year low for females, comprising 16% of popular artists on the top charts. Across the board, women are more likely to receive a credit as a solo artist and rarely appear in duos and bands. Female songwriters and producers have even been more egregiously outnumbered. Just 12% of songwriters of the 600 most popular songs in the last six years were women. That's some serious statistics going on right now from 2017. While there were only 2% of producers across 300 songs that were female. So to put that in perspective for you, there's a gender ratio of 49 men to one woman. So some of the quick other facts is that we know that women in Hollywood, you know, of the top grossing films of 2017, eight were directors. 10 were writers, two cinematographers, 24 producers, and 14 editors. And of course, sadly, of those top 250 films, 3% composers. So, with that being said, welcome to Women Make Noise. I'm hoping that everybody had a chance to kind of run over our bios because I really want to jump into things, but I thought the way we would make it move a little faster um, is for me to ask a question, and then if you could, panelists, if you could just say your name and what you do, um, and that would be fantastic. Um, but I think starting out with producing and songwriting, I'd like to pass this to Alex first. Um, Alex has worked with Troy Sivan, Tovlo, Jack Atnoff, Mickey Echo, just to name a few. And I'd love to know how you got your start and how it all sort of came together for you to be a songwriter producer. Okay. Um, it's a loaded question. Yes. Uh, it all started um, basically as like a therapeutic way to deal with being in high school and something that I just did alone in my bedroom uh, and I slowly just fell more and more in love with music and just thought I have to be a part of this thing that can make people feel so many different emotions. I just thought it was the most powerful thing. Um, and so I started making 
uh, little EPs in my bedroom, recording songs, just watching YouTube videos um, about how to how to kind of make sounds. And then I met an amazing female publisher in Australia at Sony ATV called Marie Hamlin, and she really um, inspired the production part of my journey and just thought, she just, yeah, she said, you love playing instruments, you're kind of a geek, you like being on the computer, this just makes a lot of sense for you. And also, you know, there are so few females. She's like, I really think you should, you know, pursue this and not just sit back on the songwriting part of it. And so, yeah, I owe a lot of it to her encouragement. Did she sign you? She did. She signed me when I was 18. Nice. Yeah. Um, and how did you meet her? Um, I met her through, honestly, just like the hustle of mailing CDs, unsolicited demos to people and giving a bunch to my mum and she would just go out and if she ever was in a conversation <laughs> with someone that was maybe remotely in music, she would just like, <laughs> and I think it just like slowly travelled through and got to her and so again, I thank my mum a lot too. I love it, that's great. She is amazing. Not your mom. I'm sure your mom is amazing. Mom is Maria, awesome. Awesome. I'd love to meet her one day, but Maria is incredible. She really is an, an amazing champion. Mm -hmm. And and she's turned me on to a lot of music as well, too. And yeah. when we've done work together, she's just incredible. Another person to know. Which leads me to my next question, my next panel, since which Loretta you know, is from ASCAP, sitting right to my immediate left. Red is the VP of membership group at ASCAP and yeah. AVP. No, she's the AVP. I always get those confused at PRO. Sorry, babe. Um, but she, but Loretta's. Um, when when I think of Loretta and all the amazing things that she does, um, one of the things that she is and what her job entails is connecting dots and connecting people. And she is the most amazing connector of talent myself included, of introducing me to many people that I've gone on to have working, fruitful relationships with. She develop, develops opportunities for promising, promising new talent and established artists, the recruitment of songwriters and repertoire. She creates and she, she has mentorships going. Um, and she's also, like we said, she runs a very successful event at Sundance for a very long time called the Sundance Music Cafe and um, our nights are right there together, so we get to spend a lot of time together. So, Loretta, I'd like you to sort of talk about what your job entails and how you connect. Like, I think this is a nice tie-in with Alex of what you do and how you champion and what your role entails. Um, at ASCAP, working in the membership department and several of my colleagues here that work all together uh, and supportive, and, and do many of the uh, same um, uh, things in championing writers, in, in building the repertory. So as the repertory is stronger, we have more money that's coming in that we can then turn around and give to our members. So that's the nuts and bolts of it. And in the membership department, and in my office, and along with many of my colleagues, it is meeting with writers, uh, signing new writers, trying to, actually, it's, it's really great to sit and listen. I love to, to meet with people, sit and listen, because if you give someone 10 minutes, 15 minutes, they reveal a, a whole bunch of stuff, and the angst goes away of what they want to do, who they want to meet, where they want to go, and then it just slowly, you give them space enough to be creative and imaginative, and then you can help connect those dots, whether it's um, if it's the right time to meet a collaborator, if it's the right time to meet a business um, champion or a label or a publisher or a music supervisor, producer, or connecting, you know, just connecting. It's, it, as Tracy was saying, and connecting those dots. So it's listening a lot and trying to create new opportunities, whether it's the baby writer that's just come off the bus or an established legacy artist that wants to. And, and we work in all different genres. It's all global music now, the way we access music. So it's super exciting and work, being able to work 
on the music um, advisory board with women in music and also working for a long time. ASCAP's been dedicated to working with the Sundance uh, Film Festival. To be able to see that broad um, scope of how you can help people at different levels. And it's safe to come to your PRO, your ASCAP. Well, of course, I'm going to talk about ASCAP, but to the PROs because it is, we're there to champion. We're there to help. We're there to also answer those questions of where is my, why didn't I get my, and uh, um, it, so it's, it's, it's multifaceted, but super exciting to be able to, to work with Jermaine Franco, to work with, you know, the singer-songwriters coming, to work with Alex. And um, uh, it's, uh, that's my story. And I can go on for a long time with a lot of writers <laughs> and good. composers, but I turn it back to you, boss. I love it. <laughs> um, so um, right next to uh, Loretta is Jermaine Franco. Uh, you know, Jermaine is the first Latina composer invited to join the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Science as music brand. <laughs> And she's badass. Um, she um, recently scored Tag, and she, the, um, her highest profile big studio feature, um, but she was the first woman hired by New Line Cinema to um, score an R-rated comedy for the studio. Achievement, 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 and it doesn't stop there. She produced, arranged, and orchestrated the Oscar-winning song Remember Me from Coco. She scored dope. Um, some uh, 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 <laughs> The film. <laughs> no, I, I kind of like my joke exactly the way it sits right now. Um, but and recently, we asked Cap. She was the recipient of the Shirley Walker Ask Cap Award for the Top Box Office Film Award. And so, Jermaine, I would love to talk about um, how you got your start, where it's taking you, and we're going to talk a little bit about, with you and with Laura, who I'll introduce next, um, about our 3%, kind of like 3%. Okay. Well, first, I have to thank uh, Tracy and Loretta, who were my mentors in Women in Film. And then also Laura Cartman was one of my mentors at the Sundance Music and Sound Design. And I wouldn't be here without my main mentor, John Powell. That, that's how I got to sit in this chair. But many, many, many hours of practicing <laughs> and writing and playing and performing. Uh, I, I am a person who makes noise. You can ask my son because I'm a percussionist. <laughs> And uh, I also play keyboards, but I started out playing drums and the marching band and then orchestras and jazz groups. I went to Rice University and just had a huge passion for music from very young age. Nobody in my family was a musician, but I had a lot of great teachers. And I'm always grateful to all my teachers because I, I think they're the ones that always led the way, and um, I, had, I moved to LA after I had my graduate degree and just decided, I had gone to New York and thought, ooh, too cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I came here and I didn't know anyone. I had one person's name and it was Luis Conte who plays percussion with, well, he plays with James Taylor now and uh, played with Madonna, just amazing percussionist, and I just really was into hand percussion, and I just wanted to learn from him. So through that, um, I literally moved here, no job, but I started gigging and teaching, and I started writing in theater at LATC, which is Los Angeles Theater Center, and Universal Hispanic Film Project was my first project. And at that moment, on the box scoring stage on my first film, I met Jeannie Weems from ASCAP. Nice. And it was Jeannie, I was working with Armin Steiner, and it, I had a light go off. I like this, you know? I had never been on a scoring stage, and I just had this 
you know, amazing experience with play, because I always play on all my scores that I could play and produce to the picture. And I was always inspired by the, the visuals. So, and I love to collaborate. So long story short, I wound up working with John Powell and he was my mentor for many years. And that's how I learned my craft. And eventually I left him, but I have to say, I through the years I have had so much encouragement through many different organizations. And I really encourage every person in the audience to take advantage of those, whether it's your PRO, obviously I was with ASCAP, but you know, these organizations are set up because we're trying to increase our numbers. We're trying to move the needle. We're part of the 3%. Laura and I have these long discussions. And we want to see more, you know, women and people of color join us. And it's a, it's a tough road, but I just encourage everyone not to give up because there is space for all of us. And uh, I, we're, that's our goal, besides making great music. So right next to uh, Jermaine is uh, Laura Cartman, who is an amazing composer. And this is Wendy Christensen. So Laura has a doctorate from Juilliard. She's a concert and theater composer. She's also done music for Mozart in the Jungle, Inventing Tomorrow, The Beguiled. Um, Underground and the WGN, that network we both worked on. Um, but she's also a, not only an amazing and incredible talent, but she also is a fierce champion of female composers. Um, it's how um, we connected and met. And I'm so happy to know her and call her a colleague and friend. She serves as an advisor for the Sundance Film Scoring Labs. She's on the faculty of USC's uh, Film Scoring Program. She is the founding president of the Alliance of Female Composers, and she is the pr proud to be the first female governor of the music branch of the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences. Or I'm so happy that you're here today, and um, I wanted to kind of, um, one, to talk about um, to sort of expand on the 3%, but more importantly, how do women break the doors down? How did you break the door down? And how did this come to be your passion? This being film scoring. Correct. Um, I'm bre still breaking the door down. I, I wish there were a moment where that door is like clearly broken down, but I think that that's, that's what we're doing. Um, and we're trying to break it down for not just ourselves, but for other people too, as Jermaine said. Um, you know, I never wanted to be a film composer. I grew up in L.A. My mother didn't pass my CDs around, but she okay. did um, decide that she wanted me to be a composer when she was pregnant. So <laughs> I went for that path, the path, the path of least resistance, but I just fell in love with music, of course, and it was, it's just always been what I've done. And then I wanted to be a concert music composer. I'm actually a second-generation native Angelino, but I wanted to be a New York intellectual. So I went, <laughs> left LA, I went to New York. I studied with Milton Babbitt, who, if any of you know who he was, he was, you know, a New York intellectual. And, um, and then he called me one day and he said, I have an opportunity for you. And I thought at that moment, he found me like a teaching job. And uh, he said, I want you to go to the Sundance Institute. And I thought, it's the last thing on earth I want to do, is go to the Sun, you know. But I figured it's three weeks out of New York. At that point, it was three weeks long in the kind of the first um, iteration of the labs. And so I went, and my world turned upside down. And it turned upside down. Um, and so many people have been to Sundance will tell you, you know, the same story in, in various iterations. But not only, you know, had I always been interested in drama, plays, but also opera, but um, the technology just blew me away, just being able to write music with computers, which I had never seen. At those days, it was new, and in the days when dinosaurs roamed the earth. But the other thing that was interesting um, is there was a guy there, whose name was Don Walker, who was a, like, a studio kind of furniture building, and he was there with his wife. Um, and she was kind of in the background. She wasn't really there to, you know, to mentor or do anything. She was there as his guest. Well, it turns out that person was Shirley Walker. 
And Shirley um, was not there as an official advisor because, of course, she wouldn't be. I mean, but her husband was, but okay. And she, <laughs> um, she helped, you know. She got me out there conducting, which I wasn't going to do. And mm. she, really, um, she really pushed me. And I think that was the first time I'd seen that something like this could even be possible. Um, I'd studied a little bit with Nadia Boulanger, who was a great kind of teacher of composers, and there were lots of women composers in that circle as well. So I think, you know, some of the things that we're saying is that you have to see it, same with producers, you have to see it to believe it. And so um, I saw it and I saw it was a possibility, and right after um, Sundance, I moved back here and started, um, started working, you know, in the business pretty soon afterwards. Oh. It's an amazing story. Yeah. I didn't know that all happened from the magic at Sundance. Yeah. Yeah. And then I became an advisor at Sundance, you know, I think like 15 years later, and that was that felt really incredible to have started my career there and to go back as an advisor. It's such a mad, it, it needs magic to go up there. Um, and so all the way, and then hi, Wendy. Hi, and thank then, you. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy is the Senior Vice President of Film and Television at Warner Chapel Music. Um, she's responsible for securing creative licensing opportunities for the Warner Chapel and Warner Music Group catalog in the film and television area. And she also oversees the day-to-day -day of the West Coast licensing staff. Um, she's also a fierce, fierce advocate for art, for women, and for independent film. And I'm so happy you could join us today. And Wendy, if you could, I would like... Um, you know, what I love about the diversity of our panel is um, we were talking to Alex earlier, but you work with songwriters, you work with artists, and I thought maybe you could share with the audience a little bit about how you got your job and how you got in the business, but also what your, what your daily um, responsibilities entail so we can kind of highlight. Well, I guess I got in the business because I couldn't be a musician or a songwriter. So I had to find another way to get into doing something that I really loved because I still have to work to make money and survive. Um, I thought I was going to do A&R because that was really exciting and very flashy. And I went and did that for about a year and figured out that's not at all what I want to do. <laughs> Who wants to be in clubs all hours of the night? You know, back then you could smoke in clubs and it was just, you know, a disaster for me personally. And more often than not, you see a lot of really bad bands or really bad artists and then you find that one or two, you know. <laughs> Diamonds in the rough. <laughs> but, um, I had a dual role at that particular job where I was assisting someone in the A&R department and then this person in the licensing department. I was like, what is that, you know? And I just started to learn more about what that meant. And at the time when I, was, when I started out, artists almost didn't want to license because they thought it was selling out. So everybody kind of shied away from it. So it was really a good learning curve at that time because it wasn't the intense pressure that it is today. Now the department that I head is almost the breadwinner for the company, which is very different than when I started out. The idea of that the two worlds meeting was really fun and you got to use both sides of your brain. It wasn't just the creative side, but then you had to make the deal work. And you know, every budget's different, every artist is different, and I think that's the way we should look at each individual opportunity is on its own merit. There is no rate card or you know what you do in all instances. I think the goal is to find that sweet spot where you get the most for your songwriters without killing the deal. Yep. So I guess when I started to get introduced to that side of things, I kept going down that path rather than the A&R path, <laughs> signing artists that I didn't necessarily believe in. And then one thing led to another, and you start to get some opportunities underneath your belt and take advantage of them and sort of prove that you know what you're doing and building a team. I have a fantastic team. And I'm only as good as the weakest link in the team, so the idea is to support everybody. Did I answer the question? You did. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are discovering more and more music through a visual medium, so I'm... I'm going to bring it back, back to you, which is, how does that impact your day-to-day -day life now? Like, where we have lots of different budgets and lots of different productions, and 
myself of being a champion of independent film, where um, the coffers don't have so much in them at some times. Um, but, but also, when is it like art versus commerce a little bit? Can you just touch on that? Because I think it's because I think it's a, it's a slippery road. And as music supervisors, when we see a big song in a small movie, our the hair goes up on the back of our neck, and then we have to call and try and make a deal, and and it becomes. That, that balance, and I think it's important because now there's more and more content being made, and the budgets seem to be the way they were in 19, you know, do that the year 2000, like they've gone back. Um, but do you see that as well? Well, absolutely, and it's, a, it's, it's the forever changing landscape, and I think it's always the, the balancing act that you try to find with each individual project, like I was saying. Every artist also has a a specific goal in mind. Sometimes it's about, that's, a, that's my favorite song of all time, and I don't want to license it. I'm going to be very special about it. I'm only going to do it for certain projects, and I'm only going to do it for the top dollar, and you got to pay me tons of money to use it. Then there's songs that have a, a meaning to them that it's not about the dollar, it's about the right project. Then there's, I have a new album coming out, and I want something to catapult it, as we all know what radio has done, and album sales in general. So it's finding that, that sweet spot, that match that makes sense with the cycle of an album coming out or the release of a single. Is there a project? Will there be some support behind it? Will we get some marketing? And in that case, we're also a little more flexible with budget. Then there's just the brand new artist that's so thrilled to be involved with anything <laughs> <laughs> that um, we have a lot of flexibility in making the deal. You know, but then you have another thing. This it's never just about the artist because oftentimes there's songwriters involved, and that becomes a little tricky. So even if you have a new artist, but you've got these massive songwriters attached to it, that complicates the licensing process as well. Oftentimes we'll talk about the artist taking a little less than the publishing in certain cases. Um, sometimes in an independent film, it's about getting creative about how you structure the deal. It becomes about back end, it becomes about step deals, it becomes about, I don't know how else we structure things, but we do. We get creative. Um, and surprisingly, artists are open to it, particularly if it's a project that they care about. Mm -hmm. And we talk about that too sometimes. Tracy's involved in films that have a, you know, they're about overcoming odds or about somebody succeeding or something heartfelt about discrimination. And if I find the right artist that cares about that issue, you'd be surprised what people are willing to do. It's true. And then sometimes you'd be surprised about what people are not willing to do, given the cause. Right. <laughs> so it goes. And for us, who work at you know organizations that represent lots of songwriters, it's really about getting to know your songwriters and where they're affinities lie and what's important to them and at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's just about that single or working what they're doing at the moment. Sometimes it's in between album cycles and they're looking for something really cool to do in between. Can't tell you how many times I have an artist that wants to be a songwriter or a songwriter that wants to be a composer or you know, somebody always <laughs> wants to be doing something else. Exactly. Then you get creative with get that songwriter Maybe he's not going to get paid, but he normally is going to get paid, but he's going to get to do a little scoring, right? Not the whole thing, but maybe dabble in or do a little bit and have something contributed. That's meaningful, too. Not to take away from, you know, a composer where that's what they do, because it's a very different mm -hmm. muscle and it's a, a different craft. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we have to do that to get the deal done. Exactly. Um, so I'd like to throw out a general question, and I'm hoping that everyone can answer it, but the title of our panel is Women Making Noise and highlighting the highlights of, so I would, if it's okay, I'd like to start with Loretta and just move our way down um, briefly and just hearing like everybody, uh, um, so it's a, it's a twofold question. Number one is, do you ever think there was a barrier that came across your way because you're a woman. Um, if you choose to expand on that, you may. And if you choose not to, that's totally fine. Um, but also when your break was, when there's a point in all of our careers, and we've all done quite well here to say, this, I, like, I can do this. Like, I, I went from, 
I don't know if I can do it. I know that even starting as a music supervisor, there would be a lot of naysayers. People like, it's so hard to break in. How are you going to break in? It's, like, it's a big deal about breaking in. Um, and so everyone up here has had to find their way to, to get through a door that maybe somebody told you couldn't walk through for whatever reason, and what was that? I have to say I was raised by a very, very strong mother who came with lots of limitations in her family just in the time that she was raised and, and, and background, and she instilled in me that that was not the case in my life. So I, I had that support, and, I, and also when you're young, you're fearless. Yep. And, what, and I always loved songs and songwriters, knowing, never knowing that this was actually a career path because I wasn't a good singer and I wasn't, I wrote poetry, but I didn't have that, that, that wasn't my focus, but I just loved music so much. And then flash forward, so I was always of the school, someone would say, uh, a friend when I moved to Los Angeles said, hey, I have a recording studio, could you help me manage the studio, I need some help and, and all, and can you do that? And my, my answer was always, sure. And then I kind of walked back and go, oh, my God, how am I going to do that? But I would learn, and you just do it. Or, or that was, always, that was my, my, my mantra that I'd say. You just do it, you figure it out, you do it, and you ask for a lot of help. Right. And my, so having that, and as I was saying, and being young and just very um, uh, driven, so by any means necessary. Yeah, and I had a great group of, of friends and that I was coming up with as well. And we were super supportive, and I still have that circle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it expands, and some go away, some come back in. But I've always had a very strong foundation of friends, and, and we all have each other's backs, and, we, and I work with really great colleagues, and I've had that through my life. But my break to go through was a woman, Pat Woods, from <laughs> Warner Chapel, who's still at Warner <laughs> Chapel, and she was tough. She was, I wanted to learn publishing. I, no changed. Was, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what publishing was, but I saw all these songs, and they were published by Chapel Music. I'm like, what's Chapel Music? I love so it. So I walked in cold. <laughs> and, and gave a great speech to the receptionist who happened to be a songwriter. You, went to the, you actually went to the receptionist? Yeah. I said, so I want, I don't know about this, this, this. And, and she called Pat Woods and said, I think you need to see this person. <laughs> and I talked, Pat, Pat's, you know, asked me if I knew how to type and answer phones. And I was like, sure. And I had no idea. I, had, I was a ceramicist. That was my, <laughs> but I love music, and that was my break. That's hilarious. And there, I love it. there have been times, there have been times um, uh, where it's been in tough and pushing through. But I have to say, my background and my support from family and how to how to move forward, I've been able to navigate it. Mm -hmm. Myself now, looking back, in different situations that I was in as a younger woman. I was able to extract myself from situations that were ch that were very challenging and not right, and also take other people out of those situations. But I didn't have the correct mindset to stop the situations. And that, being older now, I'm aware of that and trying to impart that to younger women. That's great. Um, thank you. So we're going to move on a little bit faster, but Jermaine, um, how about a, a breakthrough moment for you? No, I, I just got my... Okay, uh, one of my breakthrough moments was when I was working on Coco, and I was asked to go to Mexico with 10 days notice to produce 70 minutes of music, which I also arranged and orchestrated. Wow. And prepped all the Pro Tools sessions. Just like, they were like, oh, so we're giving this to you. And I had a moment to either sink or swim, and I swam, I got my team together, and I rallied and just, just kept going. And that moment where you think, oh, I'm a woman, I walked into a Mexican studio, and I had said, I got to pick the musicians, and I said, 
I want more women musicians, and the result was two women musicians out of 50, 48 <laughs> men. And I come, I'm a Latina, Mexican American, and that coming from a very a culture that has excluded women as composers and in many other you know fields. Not to mention also in Hollywood, we know there are very few women of color working as composers. Um, I just had to just do it. You know, I couldn't worry about if there were any macho dudes who didn't like the fact that the, there was a woman running all the sessions. And so I just went in there for the love of music. And that's how I overcome the barriers, is that if I get um, any kind of attitude right. or, uh, you know, any kind of tension from someone who doesn't like, at, you know, getting creative directions from a woman, I always just focus on the music. Laura? Well, I'm gonna, I think, answer your first question, okay. which is, which is um, about the 3%, why Please those do. numbers are so low. Um, I guess I would ask the audience if they think women and people of color are capable of writing music. Uh -huh. So if you think that, and you see that the numbers basically don't include women and people of color, then you have to admit that there's a problem. And so I think that that's, that's what we're looking at very carefully. What, are there barriers? Of course there are. And they're, they're massive. And, um, but they are starting to break down a little bit. And I have to say, I think that there's been a, a pattern of awareness that one of the things we've talked a lot about are these numbers that Martha Loutson and the Sundance is doing, that literally when you have numbers, the numbers don't whine, the numbers don't lie. If 3% was our big year, by the way, generally it runs about one or 2%. So, and it's the same thing for men of color as well. So, you know, we're looking at that. At the Academy, we have an initiative where we're, um, where we're actively bringing in um, members, international members, women, people of color. We think that we can lead the way. Um, I don't know if we can, but we're going to try. Um, and a breakthrough moment, I think I might be having one now because I've got three series this fall, which nice. is the first time <laughs> ever. You know, and big ones, like a CBS series with Ava DuVernay, another one with, with Greg Berlanti, another with Steven Spielberg. So it's... Just I, a few I, people. Yeah. I think we're seeing an opening, and I know that, and I, I bet you're having the same experience, um, they're, they're, uh, we're getting uh, requests for reels a lot for, for female-driven projects. Of course, now we're all up against each other, and that's a whole other complicated thing. <laughs> you know, before we were just fighting the guys. But, but, um, but yeah, there are barriers. That doesn't mean that they're not um, scalable, because they are. Obviously, we're proof of that. But is it harder? And at times, will you look at yourself and question your own abilities? And uh, yes, you will. Um, but that shouldn't stop you. So Alex, um, you've had a, a tr you've had tremendous success, and I love that even from a young age you talked about um, very few female composers, songwriters. So, what was the breakthrough? What made you determined, like by any means necessary? Because obviously it's your passion, and um, and when you had, what was your moment? I mean, I had, yeah, I had amazing parents that, you know, I never, I have two younger sisters, we were never made to feel that we couldn't do something because we were girls. It just wasn't ever a thing. So almost when I started um, producing and songwriting, it, it almost wasn't until, you know, someone like Marie actually told me like, hey, you're one of the few producers. I was kind of like, oh, really? I thought I just hadn't come across them yet. And then for ages, I just thought it was an Australian issue. And then I came to America and I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, for, like where is everybody? Um, so I think that, um, I mean, my breakthrough, I mean, I have a creative father, he's an author, and I, I got to grow up seeing his work ethic and someone supporting his family doing what he loves, which was very inspiring. And I think that, they were also, my parents were very pragmatic and they basically gave me a year after high school to make something happen or I had to go to uni or college and do something else. So I wrote like 400 songs in that year. I just sat in my room, I just sent it all out and then that was like, you know, I was 18 and then I signed my publishing deal at the end of that year and I had um, my first number one in Australia when I was 19. What was that? 
Uh, it was for, I was writing a lot of songs for X Factor in Australia. Neat. Um, which was great. It was awesome. It was such a, it was such a good learning experience. And then I feel like that was kind of a break, but then I feel like when I started working with uh, Troy Sivan and he was, you know, really supportive of me producing what we were writing and then having that released over here and kind of do what it did was kind of felt like the real break. Cause that was, you know, the first one I was just writing it with Troy, I was producing these songs, yeah. you know, and you know, on my own, there wasn't co-producers, there wasn't, and that for me was like a real, um, a real moment. Um, but I had so many amazing mentors and a, a lot of really generous male mentors that gave me so much of their time, let me use their studio, would sit and answer a bunch of my annoying questions about how they were making that and how they did that. And, you know, I was really lucky to have a great support system. Awesome. What a great story. And it all, I mean, your parents, and you must be very proud, it all happened quite, you had a nice ride, a nice ride pretty quickly. Yeah, it was, I mean, a testament I, to I your talent, quite, by the an, way. an immediatist, and I have very, I, you know, the minute I, I picked up a guitar, I was like, okay, dad, so I'm going to drop out of school and I'm going to do this. And he was like, just learn like three chords and then come back to me. So I think it was always just for me, it was just like, if I want to do it, I'm going to, I'm like very obsessive. And um, I just had to, there was no other option for me. Um, so I would love to just hear from the panel um, as we're coming to a conclusion, but um, I think what Laura touched on is very important about um, n no, reaching out, like speaking up, um, having more women writing, women producers, songwriters in our, in our field. But you know, one of the things we do at Women in Film, we have, a, an or we have a program called Reframe, and Reframe entails making sure that every list, when you get a list on a project, if it only has male songwriters or male composers, that we're including people women, we're, we're reaching out to people of different ethnicities, that we are trying to be inclusive, and that's how the culture changes. You have to change the way you think. Um, and I think that's quite important, but for our parting words, I would love to hear some advice, um, like words of wisdom that you can share with the audience as our audience takes away. Um, we, I mean, I want you to know that if this is something you believe in by any means necessary, hard work pays off. It sounds cliche, um, but also carrying yourself as a hard worker and, and doing and putting the time in because we all got here because we had to do the internships and get the coffee and learn and what Alec asked the questions, be in, thinking that you're annoying when you're not. Um, but please jump in. So, um, Loretta, do you have some words of wisdom? Some women make noise words of wisdom? Women make noise. Uh... Oh, nice. Oh. That, was, that was a nice sound. That was our sci fi effect. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Um, let's see, words of, words of wisdom. I, I, I was talking to, uh, with my a colleague, Amanda Schaffner, who's here, and we were talking about just sort of obsessions, and I think we, you and I had this conversation. It is, um, a, in our time, in our life right now, it's so noisy, it's so crowded, and to take that time for quietness or to get out of the, the focus where you, you're getting so much input and allowing time to be quiet, getting out of your environment, even if you go for a walk up the block or, or, or are able to get out of town or just sit quiet for a second and put devices away to allow that quiet and the imagination to then come up again and, and seize you. And if you're the composer or the songwriter or the filmmaker or any in any creative area or even in, in business to come up with creative deals, you need some moments to, to to think and to allow that expansion of the imagination that you had when you were a child. You know, and also, of course, always, you know, you, you show up, you persevere, all the things that we know, but to remind ourselves about that. Well, I wanted to ask how many people are artists or songwriters or composers. I'd like to see that. And music supervisors and business people. 
Okay, okay. So for the artists, songwriters, composers, I think the biggest thing to do is to write every day and develop a body of work, whether it's for a project or not, just keep writing all the time. Even if you think, if you don't have a job, you're writing for yourself and you develop, develop a library. And then also just being in this business can be very time consuming and just to take time for yourself, like Loretta was saying, because this is a job that you, you could do 24 seven and we forget that. And so it's always nice to go back and take care of ourselves. Thank you. All of that is, of course, great advice. I, I would say to, um, to creative people, get yourself on lists. Apply for, if you have a movie that's, if you're a composer, you've had a movie that's been theatrically released, get, make sure that we know that you've, that you've done that at the Academy. If you have a CD out, a soundtrack out on CD Baby, make sure that you apply for a Grammy. Right. Enter your stuff in the Television Academy. Part of what happens is you get your name out there, and even if you think you don't have a chance in heck, and I say that because our boys are in back, um, of, getting, of, getting, um, of getting an Oscar or, or, or a Grammy or a, an Emmy, it doesn't matter. Get yourself on those lists. Get in the practice of making sure that you're included and that your name is on those lists because we need to know that as well. It's very important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say write as much as you can, uh, even if you feel like you don't have anything to write about. I used to just like watch movies and try and write a song from the perspective of one of the lead characters, or I'd like put scenes of Grey's Anatomy on mute and then like try and write a really really sad song. Um, and just like, just things that you, like you don't have to be heartbroken. You don't have to have lost someone. Like you can find inspiration. You can find things to do. I felt, I just, I exclusively only listened to songs that I found on Grey's Anatomy for a period of time. Um, and I would also say like find a champion, like find your person that's going to really be there for you and also, and just use people as resources, like ask them millions of questions. Like it's okay to feel like you're being annoying. Um, and then, yeah, when you find that person that's like really believes in you, it is like stick with that person, create a little team so you feel, you know, like you've got some help there. Just to mirror everything that's be being said here, I think you follow your passion. Don't try to do something somebody else wants you to do because it never succeeds as well. Do what you really love, and particular in the beginning, um, over deliver because that's what gets you recognized and then find really great people to work with ask them questions but most importantly listen especially when you're starting out spend a lot of time listening to people that you look up to or you believe are doing well in the business because you'd be surprised when you ask questions how much people love to talk about themselves and you'll learn so much from it if you're really listening that's great advice um, and also, I would say one of the things that have come up of just like tying in our, our women make noise and things about women and some of the th things that we've researched at Women in Film is that sometimes women don't feel like they have a voice at the table. They're finding it hard to find that voice at a table. Um, women, it seems from our research, have a harder time asking for money or closing deals or finding your worth. Um, and I would say that sometimes, you know, I've, I've been guilty of this. I'm like, Somebody was doing a supervision gig when I started for five. I was in there for twenty five hundred, you know. Instead of kind of like like instead of finding your your value, but making sure that you know your confidence, that you work hard, that you research, that if there's people that you admire, that you're doing that research. Um, but networking is also a big deal. You never know where you're going to meet someone and how you're going to get that break. Um, so for all of us that are in this independent world of making sure that we're keeping all those opportunities open, but also just being well researched and, and believing in yourself and, and also paying it forward. So for anyone who has, um, a, especially for the ladies in the house, but, um, and men who are seeing young women coming up because now we know and we're wrapping up about our statistics. I would highly encourage you, or if, even if you could at some point today, reach out to them with a text or a tweet or an Instagram to say you can do it because you can. And, um, and I think that's the way we're going to wrap it up. <laughs>
Oh, one, we more, have one, one more. more thing. One more word one, of advice. One more thing. But when you mentioned, and we always talk about, you, it comes up, uh, getting in, getting a seat at the table. When, you, when you're in that room and you're at the table, it's not luck. You're at the table because you have something to deliver. So it's the responsibility is to speak up. You're at the table already. And your worth is there. And your work is there. So... Own it 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.